science disproves religion. It disproves religion. You have all of these scientific things that are happening, all of these conclusions and the things that we consider fact, and your revelation, whether it's the Bible, whether it's the Quran, whether it's your prophetic traditions, whether it's your scriptures, they are saying some things that are not really scientific. So what do you do as someone who believes in a religious worldview? Now when it comes from the Muslim point of view, what do you do? Say for example, I was born in the, in the 19th century and there was the scientific fact at that time that the universe had no beginning. So say I'm a scientist and I adopt that. Yes, universe has no beginning. I'm a Muslim in the 19th century, universe has no beginning. Then I go read my scripture, my Quran, universe has a beginning. What do I do? What do I do? Sorry? I believe the Quran, he says. Sorry? Toss a coin? <laughs> okay, let me go heaven or hell. Let me toss a coin. <laughs> Joking. <laughs> you have to believe in the testimony of some people, right? Well, that's a very good point. He's been, he's been listening. See, from my point of view, from my point of view, you could do both. Let me tell you what I mean by both. I'll be very careful here. You can, as a scientist, accept the fact, given what we discussed about the philosophy of science, doesn't lead to absolute certainty, can change, can have future observations that could produce conclusions. You can accept as a limited human endeavor that produces limited conclusions that are not absolutely true. And you can accept it practically as a scientist that based on our human limited knowledge, that this is what we've concluded, but it's not true that I have to enter into my creed and my philosophical worldview, but it's true from the point of view that it's practical. But I can still accept the Qur'an because it comes from a source that is true absolutely. And therefore you could never say science now contradicts revelation, especially from a Muslim point of view, because you've just committed an epistemic disqualification. One's human limited knowledge, one's divine knowledge. It's as simple as that. And you can't even compare the both because one is, for example, one understands the picture, the other just observes the pixel. <laughs> it's, just, it's not a problem. You could respect both and you could adopt both, one practically and understand it's limited and it's as a human endeavor and we're just do doing it practically. And you, you keep with the divine revelation because you know it's from the divine. Now that's a different discussion obviously. How do you know it's from the divine Hamza? Different lecture, maybe next year. But the point is, don't commit this epistemic disqualification by saying, hey, here's some scientific truth that we know that may change. And if now, since we've learned some things about the philosophy of science, it may not be absolute. And it seems to, be, it seems to contradict religious discourse, the Quran, for example, and we can't reconcile it at all, right? That's another assumption. Assuming that you can't reconcile it, what do you do? Well, you accept both, one practically, and one you accept philosophically and in your creed. And you know it's absolute. The other, it's just a pixelated understanding of the world. Allah, God has the picture, we've just got a pixel. And that's just life, and that's the history of science for you, really. Now, let me give you a case study, Darwinian mechanism. Because for some reason, for some reason, I, and I don't really get this, for some reason, Muslims, even Christians, our, our beloved brothers and sisters in the Christian tradition and other religions and people who believe in God, and even people who are just in the middle, right? And people on the fence, they're skeptics, they don't know what's going on. They think, Darwinism is a problem for religious discourse. It's not. I, I just don't get it. So I've, been, I've been seeing in the sidelines for the past few years thinking, what's the problem? How is there a problem? I don't get it. If someone just understands and studies the foundations of science, the philosophy of science, this wouldn't be become a problem for you anymore. Let me explain why. Darwinism suffers from all the limitations that we just spoke about in the philosophy of science. And we've developed a thing called PAD. Darwinism suffers from PAD. It's probabilistic, it has its own assumptions, and there are academic disputes about certain aspects of Darwinism. This doesn't mean you reject it. Oh my God, no, yeah? <laughs> it's, not, it's not like you know, this, 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 this force of evil that you just reject now. You accept it practically with the notion that it's probabilistic because it's based on limited data you may have future data in genetics. For example, epigenetics seems to be, you know, a bit of a challenge to the kind of 
old school thinking on the Darwinian mechanism, right? I'm not a scientist, I don't know much about this, it's based on testimony, of course. But things are happening, right? Things are happening. So you may have future observations and understanding in genetics or other things that can contradict previous conclusions about Darwinism itself. So it's probabilistic. You don't have all knowledge. You don't have all the observations, right? Secondly, Darwinism is based on assumptions, and these assumptions include gradualism, the tree of life, and there are many other assumptions, but you have to adopt gradualism as an assumption, right, in order for you to understand the observations. It's not the other way around, so it's an assumption. And this is why Dennis Noble, the Oxford University biologist, he said all the central assumptions of neo-Darwinism have, have been disproven. So it's based on some assumptions, and also it has disputes. For example, you have disputes like evolution by natural genetic engineering, neo Lamarckian evolution, mutation-driven evolution. Now, look, I'm going to be very honest with you. I, I don't have an academic understanding on these, right? But, and I don't have to adopt them. I'm not saying they're right, but they exist. A disputes exist on the academic level. Assumptions are there. Study the philosophy of biology. Study the assumptions of the Darwinian mechanism. They are unproven assumptions. And it's probabilistic, meaning you don't have all observations, it may change. So how on earth is it a problem? For, for, the, for Muslims at least, how is it a problem? It's only a problem if you've committed an epistemic disqualification. If you believe human limited knowledge is equivalent to divine knowledge. And that has happened only because we have an inferiority complex and because we don't know who our creator is. Because if we believe in God's names and attributes, he's Al-Hakim, he is the wise. He has the totality of wisdom. He's al-alim, he's the knowing, he has the totality of knowledge. If you believe he's the wise and all the, the knowing and he has the pixel, we just have a pixel, this would never have been a problem. And we'll just continue the science and love to do science and accept it practically. You know, you could study the Darwinian mechanism as a Muslim and learn how to deal with antibiotics and learn about bacteria and save the world. And like many Muslims do. Because the Qur'an gives us a spiritual driving principle, value, which says if you save one life, it's like saving the whole of humanity. There you go. What are you going to do? Start walking out of your Darwinism lectures? Come on, man. <laughs> do you see my point? It's not a problem. And if it's irreconcilable with orthodoxy, then so be it. Science is beautiful. It's supposed to change. And that's why the Darwinian mechanism is probabilistic from the point of view that you can have future observations that can, can, can contradict things that's, that we understand today. It's based on assumptions that are unproven. And there are academic disputes about certain key things of science. Like, is it the tree of life? Is it the bush of life? You know? But it's true, the, actually that exists. The bush of life idea exists. So there you go. So I don't see how it's a problem. So as a Muslim, you could walk into your biology class and you could listen to the lecturer and you could be empowered by the fact that you understand now what you call in Arabic the usul of science. <laughs> the foundations, the framework, the principles of the philosophy of science. Let me give you a little story. A few years ago they discovered the Higgs boson. Who knows who the Higgs boson is? Okay, some of you. Now the Higgs boson, right, was a particle they found. They observed this particle. Now originally they said, look, in the early stages of the universe, Particles had no mass, but the Higgs field was switched on. Someone switched it on. Don't know who. Well, we know who, but you know, just play with the idea for a while just to get you excited. Yeah? Someone switched the, the Higgs field on, and the Higgs field gave particles mass apart from the photon, right? So it gave, gave particles mass. Now they found the particle that made up the Higgs field. And popular magazines, YouTube, Google, even some atheists, frankly, let me just be honest. You know, the ones who don't know much about science, especially the philosophy of science. And they read popular magazines and popular books and think they know it all, right? Some of them, yeah? Th those types, they were like, oh, they found the God particle. That's what they called it, the God particle. I had Muslims emailing me saying, oh my God, my faith has hit the floor because they found the God particle. It had really nothing to do with God. It wasn't even about the beginning of the universe, it was, the, it was after the beginning of the universe, it was the how. You know, this happened because God, that's a manifestation of God's will. The reason they call it the God particle is because it was lazy journalism, guys. It was so hard to find, they called it the God damn particle. And they just removed the word damn. That's it. 
And it's a shame that popular headlines now increases the faith of the atheist and decreases the faith of the Muslim. Just because of a title. And I'm saying many of these things is as a result of a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding of the principles behind the thing that we're looking, the, the, the area of knowledge that we're studying or we're, we're, we're dealing with. And it's also based on social phenomena. Human beings are social beings, right? Whether we like it or not, we love people, right? Not all the time, but generally speaking, we like to be around. Look at today, you're around a bunch of people. So, and the social norm is developed as a result of our need to belong and our need to feel certain. This is called informational social influence and normative social influence. If I'm uncertain about something, I'm going to go to the masses to gain that certainty. Conversely, if I'm certain about something but I have a need to belong, I may give up my beliefs just to adopt your beliefs because it's the consensus or it's the masses. That's how you manipulate societies, right? That's the social norm. We have a need to belong and we have a need to feel certain. And that's why in your intellectual and spiritual journey, just try and ask yourself questions without your phone and think and just you know, meditate upon your own self and introspect as the Quran says. Think within yourself. And in themselves do they not see. Reflect and ponder. Reflect within yourself and find out is it really because of a scientific principle that I'm denying God? Is it really because of, you know, there seems to be some kind of contradiction here? Or is it because I just want to belong and I'm just not certain I don't have the right answers? We need to be more honest with ourselves because I have so many conversations now with so many different people on different sides of the theological spectrum, starting from the miso-theist, which means the hater of God, which is a group of people, by the way. If you read Professor Bernard Schweizer's book, Misotheism, the untold story of hating God, you, you see it. Actually, actually it's called Mis... Anyway, the title is something like that, yeah? Uh, it's very interesting. And then you have the atheist and the agnostic and the skeptic and the believer and the partial believer and the Muslim and the whatever the case may be. So there's a spectrum of people's beliefs, which is fine. When I speak to all of these people, many times it's not really intellectual argumentation. I'm going to be honest with you. It's not. And I've realized in my old age of 37 years and just learning from my own mistakes is I've realized that there's something else going on. And I want to end by making you understand something about first principles, okay? And I'll end on this, we'll have Q&A.